An almost forgotten kind of Scotch mist has come back to the glens after 20 years of silence. The smoke and steam of a Black Five engine. Most people would think you were mad if you told them there was still a regular mainline steam service on British Rail, but for the last two summers, the diesels on the West Highland Line from Fort William to Malague have been partly replaced by steam. They've even repainted the coaches their old pre-war colors, cream and green. Just for a while, history has gone into reverse. I get the feeling that such quirky things couldn't happen nearer to London. That up here, far from head office, they like to run things their own way. In the 1930s, the line carried thousands of weekend trippers escaping from smoky Glasgow and Clydeside into the country. After the war, when excursions were restarted in 1949, most of those trippers had taken to the roads. Yet, although the line has never made a profit, it still lives on. Today, the summer steam trains are fuller than perhaps they've ever been. But it wasn't so much tourists and travellers that the line to Malay was built to carry as something much more basic, fish. And not just any old fish, one kind of fish in particular. Now, here's a riddle. Why is a steam engine like a herring? That's right, it's because they were once both the commonest things in the world and they're now both almost extinct. Malague was actually created by the railways and through the railways grew to be the largest herring port in Europe up till about 20 years ago. This year, not one single herring has been landed in Malague so far. The main fish coming here now is the crayfish, or langoustine, which is taken away, not by rail anymore, but by lorry, and driven a thousand miles or more down to the south of Spain, where they get the best prices. So, if you're on holiday in the Costa Brava, and you have a plate of large prawns, they probably come from here. Before the trains came, the 30-mile journey from Fort William to the coast had to be done in a horse-drawn coach, bumping crazily over rough cart tracks. It took seven and a half hours to get there, so long that it could never get back the same day. The railway reduced this time to little over one hour, an improvement of something like 80%. It was almost as if balloons had been replaced overnight by Concorde, with nothing else at all in between. It was here at Korpach, near Fort William, on January the 21st, 1897, that Lady Margaret Cameron of Loch Heel, who was not just a lady, but also the wife of one of the directors, used this silver spade to turn the first sod in the Malague Railway. And it was the last really hard work she did, because she was replaced almost immediately by three and a half thousand navvies, who worked for the next four hard years to complete the work that she'd so bravely started. But they did finish one year ahead of schedule. Malag wasn't just reached by the railway, it was built by the railway. The railway company looked at a map of Scotland for a good place for a fishing port, put its finger on a tiny, nearly uninhabited dot and said, we'll build a town, a harbour and a pier here. And it wasn't just fishing vessels that came to call at the new harbour. It became a great jumping off place for the ferries over the sea to Skye and Lewis, as it is today. You could say that the first big place down the line from Malague is Glasgow, but they wouldn't agree with you at Fort William. 
the railway capital of the West Highlands, where most of the engines were always kept. Shed 65J, dock 6 plus 5 MT, Staniard Black 5 from the old LMS. One modified K4 named Macallan Moore. Five K1s, Peppercorns design. Two K2s, usually based at Mullig. And as yard pilots, two J36s. All to be maintained and serviced, engines to coal. And some to repair. What engine am I getting the danger? 1784, Johnny. The engines leave Fort William shed. To work south to Glasgow. And west to Mali. And we shall be working west to Malague today behind this 1947 vintage Black 5. Black 5s were LMS engines, so they wouldn't have been seen up this LNER line in the old days. This particular one is the only one of the many Black 5s to be fitted with the Stevenson link motion, that complicated series of connecting rods. I wonder if that makes it a one-off special or failed experiment. Well, either way, I give my eye teeth for a chance to travel on the footplate. Another thing. Okay, thanks. Well, at least I've still got my eye teeth. Our driver today is veteran Fort William man Willie Corrigan. Well, it's not as special for driving about five. Quite a good engine to drive, and the fellas looked after pretty well, you know. The Black Five's all right, but. The K2 is really the, the engine for the Marling line. Because the, the Black 5, they're just a wee bit high in the wheel for the Marling line. They used them sometimes for ballast working, you know, but they, they were never in the Marling line. Of course, there was a turntable then, they were too long for that. This train, anyway, it's just up and down, you know. But they used to be up and down the movie two or three times a day. Not so much hard work for the driver, but it's quite hard for the fireman, you know, shoveling coal and that. But, oh, it's quite an interesting line. It's a lovely run, and I've been doing it for the best part of 40 years, and I don't get tired of it yet. <laughs> we come out of Fort William under the shadow of Ben Nevis and prepare to leave the first section of single track. Only one engine is ever allowed onto a section of single track for obvious reasons, and the driver is entitled to be there only if he has the token for that stretch of line. As he leaves the section, he hands over the token to the Banavi signalman and collects the new one. In 1936, a luxury train called the Northern Bell ran right round Britain. When it got to Fort William, the passengers were given the choice between two excursions, a motor trip to Loch Ness to see the monster, or a rail trip past Glenfinnan. Only two people on the whole train chose to go to Loch Ness. Now, the attraction of going to Glenfinnan was not to see the famous monument to Bonnie Prince Charlie's first landing, which after all commemorates a great Scottish failure. Of course, the Scots have always had a great weakness for romanticising their own failures. Most of their famous battles are actually defeats, from the massacre of Glencoe up until the last time they entered for the World Cup. And they're not always so quick to glamorise their successes. But what the passengers on the Northern Bell were off to see that day was a great Scottish success, the Glenfinnan Viaduct, the brainchild of a young Glasgow contractor, Robert McAlpine. Today, Glenfinnan, tomorrow the world. And McAlpine's is still up with the leaders in modern construction and engineering. So I asked Bill McAlpine, Robert's great-grandson, to give me the lowdown on his ancestor, the man known to one and all as Concrete Bob. Uh, if, if I'm right, this was the longest concrete viaduct in the world when it was built by your great-grandfather. Yes. Why, why did he build in concrete? Why not stone? Well, he was a great enthusiast for concrete, and, and here he had an opportunity to, to use it. Of course, the engineer designed the viaduct and uh, usually specified what it was to be made of. But on this occasion, he, he, he persuaded the um, engineer that concrete would be a good material. And you can see it's still standing. There's a train going over at the moment, and it's uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not, a, falling not, not a tremor here. <laughs>
Was that actually very revolutionary at the time? Well, it was, because it was a new material and nobody likes change very much. Mm. But on this particular contract, it, it, it proved to be very satisfactory material, because to move masonry, to get masonry and to move it up here would have been very, very expensive. And so uh, concrete, which was created by finding quarries and grinding up the rock, or using the rock which came out of the tunnels, mixing it with cement was an ideal material. Stone uh, perhaps looks better, although I think in an environment and looking at this viaduct today, it actually in concrete it, it, it fits in with the surrounding scenery much better. These great solid piers, are they in fact solid? Well, I believe they're, they're hollow in the centre. I've always been brought up with a story that uh, on one occasion they were filling them. They were, had built the, the four walls and they were filling it with, with rubble. Uh, and a horse and cart was backing to tip and he just went a bit too far and the horse and cart went down one of these massive great piers and there was nothing to be done so they just carried on filling. It's still there. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, I wouldn't, wouldn't like to. An idea I'd rather the, disbelieve it. An idea that the Mafia <laughs> later took up. Yeah, I think so, <laughs> yes. Well, I think the, the man stayed up with the horse and cart. <laughs> but apart from that, if somebody came to McAlpine's today and said, build us a, a viaduct out of concrete, would you do it in a very different method? Um, I, th I don't, yes, it, it would be reinforced concrete in that it would, there would be steel in the concrete and it would probably be not quite so massive and, and so on. Although, if you look at it, and you look at it a hundred years and it's still there, this is probably a pretty good way of doing it. You mean this is good for all time, almost? Well, I think so. It should be good for another hundred years, yes. Well, the line may still be here in a hundred years' time, and Glenfinnan Station may still be open for business, but it's very doubtful if there will still be a signal room at Glenfinnan. Four bells given, four bells received, and another brass token from the Victorian one-armed bandit to hand on as a passport for the driver to go through the next stretch. But as he goes through the old routine of ringing through for permission to let the train through, he is already aware that he is the last signalman left hereabouts. The latest plan, apparently, is not only to do away with the traditional token system, but also to get rid of signals altogether. And to give the drivers radio sets so they can report their position to Fort William and ask for clearance to continue. CB on trains, in fact. The one thing they can probably never replace is the man in the engine. On the contrary, it means that even more reliance will be placed on the local driver and his knowledge of the line. It's a hard line to know. Uh, well, you've got to be ears on it. Uh, especially at night, the dark, it's just pitch black. you really got to know the line to, to drive a, a, an engine up there. Ever since the train left Fort William, it's been climbing almost all the way. You have to start again from Glenfinnan on a gradient of 1 in 50, which is a test for any driver and a lot of hard work for the fireman. It's an extraordinary thing, but almost all famous lines start low down, go up in the middle, and then come down again at the end. The Settle Carlisle line does, the Orient Express does, and so does the Malleg line. And unless you're actually driving the train, the climb to the top is the best bit. There's a feeling of heroic effort, masses of steam and smoke, and by far the best photographs. But if you are driving the train, you get a different feeling, one of setting off into the unknown, however well you think you do know it. You go away. With a train, so you didn't know when you were getting back. We went away one time, 1947, we left here on Tuesday. We never got back on the Friday. The trains were stuck in the snow in the West End. It was really hard work then, you know, and it wasn't only that. You, you couldn't get food anywhere. There was no place to get a cup of tea or once your piece ran out like, you know.
As the train eases its way over the top and starts the long descent to the sea, it goes through what the guidebooks like to call glorious scenery. But glorious scenery is a phrase that strikes fear into the heart of any railway engineer, because all it means to him is immense construction difficulties. When Bill McAlpine's great-uncle, Malcolm McAlpine, was in charge of building this section of the line, he found that the stone he was tunnelling through was even tougher than the machinery he had available. Because on a line like this, you have to start in a whole lot of places. And you start at the most difficult places. You would have started at Glenfinn and Viaduct, and of course, digging the hard rock tunnels. Mm. And there was a good story about that, because Malcolm had to go to the um, dentist in Glasgow. Yeah. And we'd been having terrible trouble because we had these new compressed air drills mm. from America and we had priced the job on using these and the tremendous progress. And when we got up here, the cost of coal for the steam-driven yeah. compressors was enormous because you couldn't get the coal to the, to the line. You could bring it up by ship and then it had to come by horse and cart or over all this terrible country. Yeah. And we were losing money and the company was going bankrupt. And he went to have his teeth drilled in Glasgow and the dentist had a water-driven drill. So he said, if he can drill my teeth with water, I can drill <laughs> tunnel rock with, with, with water. And so they dammed up one of these locks and had a water turbine to produce electricity, drove the compressors electrically, and had a pipeline uh, tapped off for, for air, compressed air all the way along the line and drilled happily It away. actually works as well? Oh, yes. Yeah. Tremendous nice. success. So there's a use in going to the dentist after That's all. right. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> The opening of the line came too late to help many of the inhabitants who had already been driven out by the highland clearances, the idea behind which was that sheep were more important than men. When the Crofters Commission reported to the Parliament in London a hundred years ago, they revealed a state of misery and poverty in the West Highlands which nowadays we would call third world conditions. Even Parliament was stunned into action and the Malague extension became the first line in Britain ever to get government help. Not that this was much consolation to the local people who had already lived a life of deprivation and suffering. Clearances, men's homes were burnt and pulled down around them to drive them off. Many of them had to make new lives, knowing they would never see Scotland again. difference to this part of the world when it came through here in 19, about 1900 it opened up the whole of the countryside between Glasgow and uh, Fort William and then Fort William to Malig and uh, they reckon that the railway made Malig and I remember clearly the fish specials say uh, leaving Malig day and night seven days a week Sunday included it had been a long time before they were able to run fish trains on the Sabbath, 
Old traditions die hard round here, and Ronnie McClellan still combines his job as an engine driver with something much more ancient, the art of crofting. Well, I inherited the croft in 1954. And you've been driving on the trains all that time? Oh, yes, I've been on the train since 1941, long before I inherited the croft. Oh, I see. But how uh, do you combine the two? Isn't it almost impossible? Or not? Well, I think when you're brought up on a croft, you find that the croft itself won't keep you. It's necessary also to have a good job. But I think when you're born in a croft, there's something, some attachment which uh, makes you feel as if you've always got to stick by it. And how serious is the threat to close it down now, do you think? Oh, I don't think there's any threat at the moment. There's been a threat, you know, there have been rumours of, of the railway closing for quite a number of years now. Mm. In fact, about two years ago, they were considering closing down the depot at Mali. But it was proved then to the powers that be that it wasn't a very wise thing to do. So we've still got the depot at Mali, and it's, it looks as if the, the railway is beginning to pick up. We've got a steam train, and we've got, we've got a few specials. Well, there's something about the steam that, that the diesel will never compete with. There's a bit of a bit of everything about the steam. There's a bit of romance. There's a bit of science. What is there about the diesel then? Oh, the diesel. It's just a big box. <laughs> a big box, and you pull the, you open the power handle, and what more can you do? <laughs> I hope and pray that it goes. That's another one ready for market. <laughs> So when you come home from driving a day on the railways, you have to look forward to getting back to you. Oh, yes, always have done. Yes, yes, it's a complete contrast from railway working. Although I've always been happy on the railway, oh. uh, happy in my job, uh, it's also a great thing just to forget all about it for a while and uh, go out after the sheep, go out to the hills, and it's a different way of life completely. During its 85 years, the West Highland Line to Malague has won and lost many battles. I think the saddest loss of all was when British Rail decided it could no longer compete with the roads for the fish trade. It left behind nothing but folk memories of the days when driver and fireman used the firebox to cook herrings on their shovels. Or when the rails were so wet from the drips from the fish specials that engines could hardly get up the hill out of Malay. The fish trains finished well before the fish did. And in the 1970s, Malague was still catching herring as if there was no tomorrow. Sophisticated echo sounders located the shoals and giant nets swept the seas clean. And then, one year, all the herring had gone and there was indeed no tomorrow. The days when the smoke from 13 kipper factories hid Malay from the sunlight suddenly seemed very far off. The steam special stops in Malay for an hour, and during this hour, the station souvenir shop closes for lunch. I never found out why, unless it was to give the passengers the incentive to wander down to the quay and see the crayfish being landed. Come to Malague and see what the Spanish get for lunch. Oh, grand journey, lovely journey. Just lovely. It's, it's a pleasure to come up the line when it's nice and dry, you know. But, uh, well, I was quite pleased with the run today. It's a good engine too. Of course, a good fettle right enough. Comes up the hills there, no bother. Well, 
Now there is an unspoken fear in Malaig that the crayfish may one day go the same way as the herring did. Of course here they don't eat crayfish, they eat fish and chips. And if I were to tell you that these chips have probably come a thousand miles from the south of Spain, would you believe me? Yes, Spanish first crop potatoes. Makes you think, doesn't it? Today, the last relic in Malaig of the great herring days is George Laurie's Kipper Factory. And even then, the herrings he so carefully splits and smokes have to be brought from further down the coast. But the ceremony of stacking up the smokehouse, laying the fires, and then letting the smoke do its work at leisure is uncannily like the ritual of firing a railway engine and getting up steam. Long may they both continue. <laughs> 